Hello and welcome to another edition of Here's the Pitch, sponsored by Masses Restaurants, five locations in St. Louis, stlmasses.com. I know I've had a lot of guests that uh, aren't from St. Louis, so if you're listening to this and you're a Stern fan or a WWE fan, some of the things I've been doing lately, drive on through stlmasses.com. You'll find directions if you're riding through the Gateway City and heading to the West is where the Gateway to the West Go to masses, stlmasses.com. Today I'm excited. Uh, another Howard Stern guest as I'm doing a series of these interviews, Casey Stuttering John, Doug Goodstein, Steve Grillo. Today, the man who created the channels, he did not create, but he was the vice president there at uh, Howard, Howard Stern's uh, channels on Sirius. Tim Sabian joins me. I'm excited to talk to you, Tim. Hello and welcome. Good morning, Brad. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Let's go. So, um, you know, we're going to talk about your career at Howard, but uh, first and foremost, uh, I see that you have some a wonderful backdrop there, and you're doing some new stuff. I want to get that uh, uh, squared away right away. Squared away. See, I'm a pun guy. Uh, Super Squares, React. Tell us a little bit about what you are up to right now. You told me on the phone in our pre-interview, we had a pre-interview, and uh, it sounds pretty cool. Well, I met a guy about uh, two and a half years ago. His name is Frank Maggio. Um, when I was working at Westwood One, building out a podcasting platform, and uh, this guy was just—he just amazed me. He, when he was in college, he went to Emory, and uh, while he was in school, he entered into a scratch-off contest where it was tied to Monday Night Football and Beatrice Foods, and for every winning game card, uh, you could win five thousand dollars. So he found out that there's patterns. He's a mathematician and he sees patterns and he's a gamer. And uh, so he managed to scratch off over $21 million in winning game pieces. So he turned it in and Beatrice canceled the contest. Uh, But besides that, while he was in college, he was selling VCRs and he noticed that people were selling or buying VCRs because of they wanted to skip the commercials. So he kept that in mind. And then uh, he went and hired a law firm to uh, litigate uh, and get his money because Beatrice canceled the contest. So he uh, graduated from college, went to uh, Procter & Gamble to work with the biggest brands like Tide and so forth and learning more about advertising and how people were spending vast amounts of money to engage and gain people's attention. So he took his experiences of uh, you know, the game fine, you know, the game that Beatrice put together and also the fact that he was selling VCRs and people were skipping ads and uh, his experience at uh, Procter & Gamble and tied it together on how he could make ads more effective. So he came up with this platform called React, which is an ad tech company. And our first product is a game called Super Squares. And Super Squares is a digitized version of the squares game that you play at Super Bowl where you write your name in the boxes and you have a chance to win a prize pool. Well, we digitized everything and put it into an app and we're the game you play while the game you're watching takes a break. So when the football, you'll download the app so um, and on your phone, and prior to the game, it'll ask you three questions uh, about the you know the game. It'll ask you you know three predictive questions that are tiebreakers. So you answer those. You set your phone down, and your phone will alert you at the end of the first quarter uh, that it's time to play Super Squares, and we'll play two 15 second commercials that are non-skippable. We'll ask you two questions about the ads that you just watched. And then we'll ask you two questions about the game that you're watching. And if you get it all correct, you have a chance to win $1 million or a chance at winning two brand new cars that we give away every single week. So it's really an exciting time. It's it's a way to engage fans, uh, put them back in the game. And we're all about putting the fans back in the game since uh, you know, COVID, you know, fans cannot attend the games and people can't jump in their sky boxes anymore. So we're a way to adrenalize and gamify, you know, the, you know, the ad, you know, version of it and also put people back into, you know, the watching the game and feel the adrenaline and so forth and reward them for their attention. I I downloaded the app uh, before we had this call and I look forward to seeing it. Uh, I know it looks like it's going to be fun and hopefully we have football here in the the near future, but uh, that's very cool. And we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. Uh, But this is not radio. You started, uh, you were in radio for a long time. If you could give me the one minute, 90 second, how you got into radio and your ascent into Philadelphia, because I think that's where people remember you from. And then we'll get into the Howard Stern stuff. But how, how does one, I know you're from Minneapolis, right? Minneapolis, the Minnesota area. Right. 
I was born and raised in, in Minneapolis, and I was born and raised in a radio station. My father was in the business, so I had a, a dinner table education uh, that was uh, just unbelievable. Uh, and I literally, I would uh, leave school and uh, jump in a cab and go out to my dad's radio station because I wanted to be with people that were in the business because I found them fun and entertaining and it was intriguing and interesting and so forth. Uh, I worked in Minneapolis and I put myself through school, uh, graduated from college and then uh, went to uh, Seattle, worked there for a year, worked uh, in Chicago at WLS in Chicago, one of the biggest top 40 radio stations. And that was really my real big, big great because it really put me on the map. And from there, I went into station ownership, uh, also went to Los Angeles, worked in LA, programmed KLOS, went back to Chicago, programmed WCKG, and worked for Cox Broadcasting. From there, I was offered an opportunity to work with Mel Carmazin at uh, uh, WYSP in Philadelphia. And working with Mel Carmazin was just an incredible experience and an incredible opportunity where I got involved in multiple stations, got in, in, you know, involved with the Howard Stern Show, and uh, the kind of the rest was history. And then when Howard left to go to um, to Satellite, he asked me to come along with him, and that's uh, uh, you know where we uh, built out uh, the two most successful digital channels in Satellite uh, ever uh, at Sirius XM. Yeah, and that's such a cool. It's it's sort of his rise too. I mean, that's what happens with radio people. You just you're never. Don't don't build a don't don't put a house uh, mortgage down. But uh, tell me what that means. So he he says, hey, come with me. What is that? Does he want you to be the Tom Chiasano? Is that basically if people are thinking of that role? And it, is it all sales? Is it what does it mean to build out his channels? Because obviously September two thousand four he announces it, but you don't really get going until what October of two thousand five. So there's this whole year of people waiting to to see what's going to happen. Well, when I, we first started talking about it, I think it was in July or August, and he asked me if I'd be interested, and I, I was like, oh my gosh, and once we started talking, I got more and more excited about it, um, and I said, yeah, let's do this. So I started in, uh, I think it was late August, September uh, of 2005, and you walk in the door, and they hand you a, you know, a balance sheet, and at the lower, or a budget, and then the lower... Uh, right-hand corner, uh, it has a number and here's what uh, it, it is and you have to build out a channel and it's like landing on the moon. There's no food, shelter, or water, no staff, you know, no offices per se, no studios, all these kinds of things. So we basically literally started from scratch uh, and uh, I sat down with Howard and you know, he told me his vision and what he thought it should be and so forth. And I sat down and took notes for literally two weeks and just exhausted him over the course of that time, asking question after question after question, then went back and put together a proposal, what I thought it should be based on what his vision was. And we agreed to it. And then I started building, started hiring a staff. Uh, started to put programming on the channels just to get uh, some workflow and to understand, you know, cause and effect. You know, in a digital world, it's a whole different thing than working in analog and terrestrial radio. Uh, so it was uh, it was a real learning curve, um, and it was very intense. Uh, you know, getting all the production together, uh, working with sales and, and developing how we're going to. You know, what are the processes and what are the, the boundaries and what are the limits? Uh, social media, getting that set up and loading the cannons as far as having the ability and the workflow to, to uh, provide and supply content to our social media channels. Uh, um, it just it was a, a daunting task. And, and uh, we had probably about 90 some people on the staff, you know, with audio, video, sales, promotion, uh, social media production, uh, talent. And, it, you know, it just, it was, it was an incredible mountain to climb, but we did it. We launched the channels on one nine Oh six. I'll never forget that day as long as I live. And it was probably one of the most rewarding experiences that I ever experienced uh, being in this industry. I mean, do you have to come up with the salaries for Robin and Fred and, and, and but it's, I know it's hot. Well, that was predetermined. You know, Don would handle pretty much, you know, the negotiation of the uh, of the show staff, but I would handle everything else outside of the show uh, as far as negotiating salaries and so forth and contracts and all that kind of thing. But but Robin and Fred and, and Gary were already predetermined. Um, but uh, other than that, uh, it was it was my ball, my bat, my game. So how do you I mean, and then you get into this go you get going. Right. And so tell me a little bit about what you're doing day to day. Are you in on those writers meetings? Do you, do you kind of help 
creatively as well? I mean, are you are you more of the business guy? It was it was always a committee, and it was, that was one of the great things about it. It was that it was a group. You know, it was a family. And when we hired people, especially when I would hire people, I would have the entire entity. You know, meet you know whoever the possible candidate was, and everybody was inclusive. It was the team. Uh, we functioned as a team. We were a family because you basically live with these people seventeen hours a day, uh, and you go through the highs, the lows, the you know, and everything in between. Uh, so you're you're involved in every aspect of the process because you have to be. You know, it's like when I started there, um, there was a couple of, you know, the people that I reported to, I, you know, reported to Howard and Scott Greenstein and, and a couple of others, but I told them all that I need to be the one that's in charge and responsible for this because I need to feel the successes. I need to feel the failures uh, in order to make the best decisions. I want, I need to live with this 24 seven because I, I need to, to figure it out as I go along here. There's no manual and how to do this so you know you just gotta you know it's it's like chasing after things and just kind of figuring it out as you go along so there's you know there's a lot of things that are, are standardized and so forth but but in the howard world because it was so unexpected and everything was immediate uh it was an incredible uh, incredible journey and th- those shows in serious aren't crazily aren't as wild as the earlier stuff there wasn't as much strippers there wasn't much you know hypogeric doing weird stuff on the floor but would you have the chance to say i don't know howard i don't know if you should do that or is it howard owns the content and i'll i'll tell him i don't know if i just you know this is a good idea i can't remember anything really terrible happening during the uh, you know the things we're kind of talking about beforehand but then it seems like you get the series really all he wanted to do was just talk and not be able to not not have to be you know, censored and have a button on them. But would you have a chance to say, I don't know about that idea. That seems kind of raunchy. Well, we, we had a lot of those discussions prior to, and, you know, language was one of the first issues that we, you know, had to tackle because all of a sudden this newfound freedom is also newfound responsibility. And, you know, going on the air and being able to say, you know, whatever you, you, know, you want, basically, and using the words that the FCC prohibited on terrestrial, was an interesting, uh, uh, you know, point in, in in the in the destination uh, because you know people would go on and you, they would swear and this and that, but you didn't want to be gratuitous, you didn't want to be you know like phony or fake, and and if it came up organically, is kind of how we kind of arrived on a decision that if it came up organically and it was real, okay, let it let let it fly. But we didn't want to just be, hey, here, we can do this for the sake of doing it. So, I mean, we exercised a lot of responsibility and a lot of thoughtfulness on it. And also just as far as stunts and that type of stuff, um, I think that we were evolving and we were, you know, learning, finding our way through it. I remember an instance where Steve Oak came in and uh, in the building, according to the building lease, you know, now at the time, Sirius XM or Sirius was a six billion dollar market cap company, and uh, we had a lease for the building that we could not do certain things. There couldn't be insertion. There couldn't be any drug use. There couldn't be uh, any pyro. There couldn't be that kind of stuff. And you know, believe it or not. Um, and uh, one day, Steve O is in the green room, and he's telling me how he wants to go on on the air and, and light himself on fire. And I said, "Dude, you can't do that. Please don't do that." You know, he said, no, 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 it'll be great. It'll be great. And I'm like, dude, please don't do that. So I walk, literally w- turned around, walked down the hall. He goes in the in the control room, rubs Vaseline on him, pours lighter fluid, lights himself on fire and does a bl- backflip. I mean, we could have gotten evicted from the building, you know, or there's things like that. There was, or Snoop would come in and smoke weed, you know, it was like, it, it, it's, it, it was, it was stressful. Um, a lot of things, but it was, it was fun. It was great experiences. Um, uh, uh, but, uh. We always always try to push the to the edge, but uh, you know without going over it, being responsible. Yeah. So, what are those rider meetings like? I mean, so, someone you know, Gary comes in and goes, "Steve O wants to light himself on fire," or someone wants to. Ins- I love the word insertion. Some of the great- the Tell greatest me. times of all time. And who, I all, who, who, all, who all gets to go? I mean, I know, you know the main crew, but I, I, Doug Goodstein was on here, and he's like, I'm in there. I mean, there's how many people are in there? And it sounded like it was kind of autonomous, like, hey, don't throw it. I, we want to hear everything, right? I mean, is that – and then how do they get to the – Pretty much everybody was invited that wanted to come, um, but it was always entertaining. And I told Howard we should tape everything, which we started to do. Uh, we, we captured everything, all the back office stuff. Uh, but one of the greatest writer meetings of all time was when we were sitting around and we would pitch guests or, or ideas and Fred, 
uh, says, or somebody says, uh, we got Joan Rivers that uh, wants to come in. And so what do we do? You know, and Fred was, I mean, one of those brilliant moments. He goes, why don't we measure her for a coffin? And the, the room just went dead silent. And everybody just burst out laughing hysterically. And then unbeknownst to everybody, a few months later, she dies, you know, which is tragic. But but it was just some of the, the most incredible moments and things, you know, happened behind the scenes that were just, I mean, I'll, I'll never forget. I'll just never forget. It was just such an incredible group of people uh, that I, I had the opportunity to work with. And it's crazy about this show because it's a radio show, but it's a TV show. It's an entertainment show. I feel like there's two great eras. I mean, the Jackie era building up into this where he goes from one station, then he goes to Philly, then L.A. So there's that era. And then there's the Artie era, I think, which would also be considered the serious era, which is my favorite. I loved Artie. Um, tell me a little bit about Artie. How hard was it to manage him? And are you kind of personally involved as, as he's kind of going down his descent? It seems like he's OK and he's making his, you know. And everyone's like, oh, Artie's not here. He's got a cold. And it was kind of, you know, talk, dap, tap dance around until we get to like 2009 where it's like, okay, what's going on? How is it to, to, to manage him? And are you in those like, Hardy, what are you doing? How does that work? Well, it was like going from the David Lee Roth era to, uh, you know, to uh, Sammy Hagar, you know, with from Jackie to, to, to Artie. And Artie was a different kind of animal because everybody loved Artie very deeply. And, and he was just a good, good soul and would help people above and beyond that. I, I, I mean, I could go on forever and ever. He was just such a, a heartwarming guy, but he had the uh, demons. And one of the things Howard and I would sit down with Artie on numerous occasions uh, and talk to him about, uh, you know, rehab or talk to him about maybe he should take some time off or, you know, this and that without... We, we couldn't accuse him of doing drugs. You can't do that. But, you know, and I didn't know what was going on, but it was, but all I knew is every time we took a, a hiatus um, that, uh, you know, Artie was getting arrested or this was happening, that was happening. And, and it was just, it was nerve wracking. It was just, uh, it was, it was heavy. It was very, very heavy. And, and, um, and you get roped into the, the craziness of Artie. And uh, it was, it was just heartbreaking. And the time that I had to tell him that, uh, we were going. Can you hear the, the lawnmowers in the back? Oh, it's been, you're. I can hear you mostly, so that's good. <laughs> okay, I, I apologize for that. It's, it's always you know. And dogs. So anyway, it, hey, this is the new world we live in. Radio edit. Yeah, um, but uh, it it was it was heartbreaking because uh, you would get emotionally involved in it. And when I had to tell Artie that we were you know going to part company, it was on a Thursday, I think it was, and he went home and. Uh, whatever and he stabbed himself like seven times and it just it, it, it sends shivers down my spine now but even to talk about it and i'll never forget the day that robin and i we went to the hospital we were sitting next to the bedside and, and he's looking at me and I, he was coming off of drugs and whatever else and he was sitting there and you know all, all whatever you know looped up on, on whatever the doctors gave him and and he looked at me like, you motherfucker, you know, and I'll never forget that look as long as I live. Um, but, and, you know, we since talked about it and all that kind of thing. And, and, uh, it, but it was, it was just very hard, very emotional. And, and uh, it was, uh, it, it was uh, a very emotional experience uh, from a business standpoint, from, uh, uh, from just a humanistic standpoint, dealing with Artie, it, it was, it was heavy. I mean, does Howard finally say, Tim, we can't do this anymore? Or do you say, how does that decision come about? We both did. We both looked at each other and said, enough is enough. Because uh, it was just draining. You know, instead of, you know, focusing and pouring your efforts into being creative and to, you know, uh, uh, advancing the business, uh, we, we were spending time dealing with arty issues. You know, it was consuming a lot of time. Um, and uh, so we made a decision and it was a tough decision. Uh, it wasn't done haphazardly, but uh, it was done out of love pretty much that for the love of the rest of the staff because it was killing everybody. But it, there was a lot of bits on the air, him falling asleep, and they're funny. Unfortunately, yeah. now that we know back revisionist, it's it's not funny, but it, there are so many. So how, does, how do you guys tap dance around, this seems weird, but it's funny. It's good for the – as Howard always said, it's good for the air. So, right? I mean, it, it had to be oh, that – as we got, to, and I remember the day when we found that there was heroin. I was like, "Oh my God, are you kidding me?" And it, it was, 
it was just uh, it was it was heavy. It was emotional. It was just everybody dealt with it their own way. But uh, you know, Howard and I kind of sat down and just what do we do? You know, it, we're kind of at a loss. You know, I can't fix it. You know, I, I we can make decisions that affect the business, but I can't fix Artie. I can't take away the pain. I can't take away you know what he's going through. So it is what it is. So we saw that you did this podcast back in January, and then he kind of just went off the face of the earth in April. Was that the first time you'd kind of gotten to really – because it sounded like he really wanted to apologize to you. And then I know people are just like, where is he? What's going on? Have you had a chance to talk to him or know what he's doing? Um, That was probably the third time that I saw him. You know, I saw him. You know, he was getting back on his feet. He really – I tell you, he really looked the best that I've ever seen him. He lost weight and and everything, and so that was good and – he seemed to be, you know, in good spirits and, and all that. And, and uh, it was really a, a loving, touching moment that he he literally wrapped his arms around me and apologized. And, and I'm like, dude, forget about it. You know, we're all good. You know, it's just um, but I, I was I was there. I, I love Artie uh, and everybody loves Artie. It's just couldn't tolerate the the drug bullshit and, and the, the inconsistencies. And and um, it was just a heartache. But it was so good to see him. You know, the last time I did his podcast, um, we talked about a lot of cool things and and got a lot of things kind of off our chests and and uh, it was good. And I just uh, I just pray that he's he's doing well and he's good and and uh, you know he's getting the help he needs. So you know, you don't have a hard. Yeah, I, just I was gonna say you don't have a hard line to him and going, come on, Artie, it's Tim. Come no, 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 no I I. I um, I reached out to his agent, uh, you know, to see how he was doing and I didn't get a response. So I don't know if that's good, bad or indifferent, but, uh, I just hope that he's getting the help that he needs. Yeah. Let's hope he reappears. So you create these networks, Howard 100, Howard 101. That, that seems like the hardest part would to be, cause he had what three channels to start when, it, when they announced it, it comes down to two. Tell me about how hard it is to say, Oh my, what are we going to put on that other channel? Right. I mean, that's where the creative comes in and that's where super fan round table and, and Pharrell and you had all these kind of, that was really where you get a chance to go, we can do whatever we want. Right. And tell me some of those favorite shows that you got to do there. Well, in building up the channels, we knew that we wanted a main channel for Howard that was Howard 24-7. It was the thinking was like uh, when you you know hit the button on a Coke machine, you know what you're going to get. You know what it tastes like mentally. You know what it, ta- you know, you, it, what, what it looks like and so forth. And 24-7, if you want Howard, you're going to get it on Howard 100. On Howard 101, we did the West Coast replay. So they would have it you know, as a morning show on the West Coast. And the rest of the day, we Howard and I decided that why don't we build out a male targeted network? Uh, because you know, someday we thought that you know Howard's going to retire, and then we would have all of this content developed that's in his likeness, that's a, you know downstream from him, that we would package, and, and uh, the Howard brand would continue to go on. And my thinking was that. Um, that I wanted to develop these shows, uh, for example, like back office radio or geek time or, uh, a lot of this other stuff that we did, which was a lot of fun doing that we'd see what stuck and what didn't stick. Uh, because one of the beauties about satellite radio is there aren't ratings. So you can try things and you don't have to worry about whether it's going to be Nielsen rated and whether advertisers will buy it or this or that, you know, we, we tried to make it in the likeness of Howard, but, uh, it was really a great exercise for me and and developing, you know, the creative part of programming because we could try things and if they worked, they worked. If they didn't, they didn't. But we developed a lot of good things that, that came out of it, like the Howard 100 News, uh, uh, like the things uh, Back Office Radio was a great show that I love uh, that we did. And, and with the comedians, with Andrew Dice Clay and with, you know, some of the bands we brought in and developed and. Uh, it was just uh, it, it was like a, a playground for programming and and Howard was willing you know to try chances. One of the great things that we did was I worked with Sam Simon in developing this uh, half hour special called the Bitter Half and it was a show about uh, the wives and girlfriends of the show wanted to keep Howard alive. Beth wanted to kill Howard for his money and it was hysterical. We put it on the air and, uh, the response was incredible and I wanted to take it and do it as an off Broadway show. Uh, but, uh, Howard got the, I think a little, a little nervous about the premise of it, but, um, understandably. Um, and, uh, but it was, we, we just did a lot of fun things and, 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 uh, had a lot of, uh, uh, great experiments working for us. So 
Yeah, and, and I mentioned I was a fan all the way up. But I, unfortunately, I, once Artie left, it was sort of over for me. I don't know. The show just didn't sound the same. And then we move into the 2013, and we've seen on YouTube there's the summit meeting. What was that like as he's sort of changing, and as Gary would always say, evolving, quote, what was the summit meeting like for you when you see Howard on that stage saying, you know, I, I want A-listers? Were you aware that this was what he was coming with? It, 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 was, it was game over. I just, I, I, it just, it was game over for me. I, I just, I, I, we were on a, an attack that was so powerful and so successful. Um, I just, um, I, I just, I, I, you know, if there was no, when, when you do a, a change like that, you got to show value add. You got to show to the audience why you're doing what you're doing. Um, and um, it, it's, it, not that it was wrong what he did. Uh, it was in the way that it happened what was, that was wrong. So, um, but it is what it is. You, it's his bat, his ball, his game. So he can do whatever he, he'd like to do. So God bless him. Yeah, and that's you said it was the beginning of the end. The end happened so weirdly. I know you've told this story before, but your father passes away, right? And you, you've decided this is kind of be my time where I want to uh, maybe take a leave of absence. Tell me that story because it does it does really. I, when I heard this, I'm like, man, that's a terrible way to end it uh, for a guy who's been with him so long. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was personal and it, you know, I says, okay, whatever. And, and I just let it go. But, uh, it was a moment. It, it, it was a lot of things. My, both my parents were dying at the same time. Um, you know, that was very hard. I never, never even knew how to even deal with that. And, uh, just, uh, it was, it was tough. Um, but, uh, you know, cause I, I literally, I, I dedicated my life to Howard. I moved from uh, Philadelphia to New York on my own dime. Um, I, I, you know, I believed in him and what we were doing so deeply and it was such a part of my life. And when that happened, it was, um, it was, it was, it was tough, but life goes on. You pick up and, uh, you, you move on. Yeah. So you did, you did move on, but what, how, how long does it take to get over not being there? Cause at this point, essentially he just says you wanted to take a leave of absence and he goes, I'm just going to let you go, which did he ever explain what, what that was about? But then secondly, uh, I, I, yeah. It's, it doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter. It just, it's, it doesn't deserve the discussion, but um, the thing is you just, you pick up, you move on. It's not how many times you get knocked down. It's how many times you get up. And uh, it, it literally like when the Howard TV crew was cut loose, you know, Doug called me up and said, Hey, I just got fired. You know, I'm like, I said, dude, it's the best thing that'll ever happen to you. And he goes, why, what, what, what do you mean? I said, it, it'll take you two months to recoup, to get your soul back, your heart back, your, you know, your, your, your psyche back, your sleep patterns back and all that kind of stuff, because you, you live it every single day. You're, you're brainwashed. You're living in a bubble. And when you get out of it and you see that there's life outside of it, you go, Oh my God, you know, and it really is like a rebirth. And, uh, so, so, you know, it's, it's what you go through, you know, and life has its ups and downs. And that was one of the greatest ups of, of, of my career. And, and I'll, I'll be forever grateful, but, uh, you know, you, you move on, you, you re, rebuild yourself, and, and that's it takes time. So it's it's all good. Well, it reinvigorates you. I, I did TV broadcasting for 15 years, and I remember after I left it, it was like this cloud. People said to me, your face looks like you don't have that scrunched up face. You look you look more alive and awake, and I and I did not know this was happening, but I knew that at the end I needed – I was like, I this I can't do this anymore. So I understand. Well, it was, it's, interesting. it's interesting because we would all – if you weren't in bed by 8 o'clock at night or by 9 o'clock at the latest – and falling asleep because you had to get up at four in the morning, three thirty, four in the morning, and uh, I mean it's grueling. And you do that every single day, um, and uh, it's everybody's sleep deprived, everybody's stressed out, and you don't realize how you know that affects you, and it does affect you, you know. Um, and then when you start to get a normal night's sleep, and you don't have that day to day pressure on you. All of a sudden, you start breathing better. You start feeling better, and and uh, it's 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 different. So, oh, trust me, I don't it's, I don't go to a psychiatrist, but I've always I have these conversations with people, and I'm like, what is a job? And is the job supposed to be you? Or are you just supposed to go work and help provide for your family? Because I loved that job. I loved working on baseball and Cardinals TV, but. I also love having weekends off and swimming and not ha and not having to worry about going to, you know, and it's so weird how that works. And I guess once you get older, hey, look, I did that. That was fun. I had a great time. I have great stories. But now I'm doing this and I love this and it makes me feel better, right? And I guess that's where we're at with you. Yeah, I, I, I loved every moment of it. It was my life for 26 years. 
Uh, and uh, I met some of the greatest people in my career. Uh, I, I experienced some of the greatest things in my career. I developed a skill set unique from 99.9% uh, .9 of the other people that do this in their life. And I was very blessed to have that opportunity and I'm forever grateful. Um, uh, so it is what it is. And, and you go on to the next thing and and, uh, and I'm having fun at what I'm doing now. So it, it's, uh, you know, and this is also very, very rewarding. This is, you know, what I'm, what I'm doing now is, is you know it's a win-win for advertisers it's a win-win for the fans it's a win-win for us uh so it's all good yeah it's a startup i mean is this considered a startup so i mean that all, yeah, totally again startup. you get yeah. to start from the from the ground up but do you miss the radio part i mean or is that hey that was this that now this is this i'm still involved in, in in it to a certain degree you know on a peripheral way um and being you know a supplier and a service to to radio and to uh entertainment so i'm still in it very much but just in a different capacity reinventing yourself but in this day and age uh radio it's not what it is i still own a radio company of uh, 15 radio stations uh um so i'm involved in it uh you know knee deep uh but um you know I, i'd rather be in the the software, the ad tech business, the gaming, you know, space of it. Uh, uh, I find this much more interesting, much more challenging, uh, much more rewarding. Uh, and uh, this company react.net that uh, I'm involved in uh, is, is going to be a multi-billion dollar company in a couple of years. It's, it's, this thing is, is going to take off and, and just uh, uh, like a rocket. It, it's so exciting to be a part of this. And just when I saw this, that there was three things in my life that I, that really hit me like lightning. It was my dad took me to see the Beatles when I was a kid. Um, and we went backstage and met him and all this. I'm like, Oh my God, this is the biggest thing since sliced bread. And then meeting Howard Stern at WNBC, that was like a moment when I met him and I saw it and I understood what it was about. I thought I want to be a part of this and I see what this can be. I, I under kind of understood what it was about because I was working in Chicago Chicago with Steve and Gary that were the guys that we were starting to syndicate. We were putting them in Detroit and, and uh, working with them and, and starting to grow that network. Um, and uh, then I went to, you know, moved on to, to other situations, but then I linked up with Howard and I, I understood that from, from day one and I was ready to go. I was the guy, I was the, the right guy at the right time to do that. So um, it was, it was just, it just felt good. So, and then the third thing was getting hit by lightning was uh, meeting Frank Maggio and uh, uh, learning about React and seeing what this is all about. And uh, so this is this is going to be a big deal. You're going to see a lot from us uh, in the coming year in 2020 throughout this year and next year, big time. I thought the third thing was going to be me meeting me and being able to talk on this podcast. So I, 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 I maybe four. Well, that, well, that was that was it was a close third, but you know. <laughs> I always uh, like to wrap up and just say, "What do you have a story that I missed? Did I did you did you have one thing you wanted? We talked about React. We talked. Is there a story that just kind of you think about from your time in those days? Is there one thing that you that you go, well, that was fun. I remember that, and that's a story I like telling. Or did we get to all of them? Um, it's just it's just the people that I met and, and worked with along the way. Uh, very very special, and uh, it's it's all about the people, and that was the the most memorable part of it. Yeah, well, it was a fun group. And uh, again, Tim, I appreciate your time. And I appreciate everybody watching here on uh, YouTube and listening on uh, the podcast apps. That's going to do it for today's show. Thank you for watching and thank you for listening to Here's a Pitch, sponsored by Masses Restaurants, five locations, stlmasses.com. We'll talk to you next time.